idea quit everyone Kojima Tashi even welcome back to episode number 57 of the NNG Fruit Podcast with me your sexy wonderful host motherfucking in 9 G oh god a beautiful gin and tonic to accompany me this week actually lads when this episode comes out I'm in the USA actually I'll be at NFA probably hung over as shit because NFA, to be honest, it's a mere pretense to get me over to the United States of America just so I can get faded off Bud Light Limes. But I'm actually flying there tomorrow. I'm recording this podcast the day before I fly to the US of A. I'll be there a couple of weeks already. Um, Now, when we're talking about the USA, here we go, guys. I am aware, for the regular listeners of this podcast, that I have not been the kindest person to fair America on this podcast. And you're probably all thinking that this podcast, along with my trip to the NFA, means... I've had a change of heart, and that's why I'm doing an episode on the American Flute School. Most likely due to the mighty American dollar. And you'd be right. No, I'm joking, I'm joking. In actual fact, uh, lads, I have been exposed to a lot more American musicians, a lot more American flute players, a lot more American flute culture because of this podcast, meeting a lot of you guys out there. The biggest listenership on this podcast is still the US of A. And yeah, over the pond, you have been very, very kind to me. It's made me reevaluate my viewpoints on certain things about America. So today's episode, it's not really a history of the American Flute School. It's not a definitive one in any case. I'm not certainly qualified to do that. What it is instead, it's a result of my own attempts to get to the bottom of this American Flute School, to understand it. Something that still feels like a bit of a fluid concept to me. A, a, a mere Irish man. A poor Irish man. A pagan. So... I'm going to work through my own discoveries in this. It's been something I've been researching the fuck out of for a lot of months now, just for my own entertainment. And you're going to come along on this ride with me and we'll see what we can work out by the end of it. So we're going to talk about the origins of the American Flute School. What is the American Flute School? Probably comparing it a lot to the French Flute School and the links it has with the French Flute School. And then, yeah, we'll end up by bringing it slightly into the modern times and see where it all goes. We're sort of, we're working this one out, lads, because I don't really know what the American Flute School is yet. I think I've done my homework well enough, but I don't really know where it's going yet. So I really hope this is a a discovery for all of us. Maybe I'll work this out as I go along. And also, please take today's episode as a peace offering, dear Americans. I can enjoy America after all. And more so, take it as a thank you, dear America. Because just before I... I've recorded this before my trip, but when this comes out, I spent two weeks in your wonderful country. And I sure they have been wonderful, because I'm sure from Olive Garden to Chick-fil-A and Bud Light Limes to Flamin' Hot Cheetos, I love you, USA. Thank you very much. Oh, and Bucky's. Holy fuck. Man, I'd never heard of Bucky's before until some, one of my students was texting me and they were like, oh, if you're going to Texas, make sure you stop in Bucky's. I was like, what's Bucky's? And I'm like, man, you wouldn't believe Bucky's. I Googled Bucky's. What the fuck is that? I look class. I can't wait to get Bucky's. Is it Bucky's Peanuts with the beaver on the front? Oh, man, American culture's great. Oh, I cannot wait for America, man. But American culture, right, that's a good place to start because before we get down this American flute rabbit hole, we have to set up the goalposts here. We have to see where we're sort of, where we're playing. We have to measure out the field, get the laws of the game laid out. The American Flute School, American Flute School, in inverted commas, if it exists, is probably a direct parallel to the famous French Flute School. Now, I've done an episode on the French Flute School. It's much more research. It's an area I am very educated on, if I do say so myself, because I studied in Paris. And I've asked a lot of famous flute players about it in France. So go check out that episode. That is a genuinely good episode. Unlike this one, which is a little bit unprepared. Um, but it's also drawn a parallel to the French flute school as well as the English flute school and the German flute school. These are all things that exist. Now, I find it fascinating that all three of these flute schools are almost direct reflections of their respective cultures. So for example, France as a culture values nuance. Individualism, not too much, but to an extent. But above all, the French value aesthetic beauty something can something warrants its own existence purely for the fact that it looks nice and that is justification in itself so it results musically then that's the culture musically it results in beautiful colors long lines really long lines of music they go on forever the french and a dogged fucking determination that every sound you make on the flute has to be the most beautiful possible it is unforgivable to not play with your most beautiful sound all the time in France. To not value aesthetic beauty is the greatest crime you can commit in France. And I love it. 
And then you look at England, fair old England over there, values tradition, refinement, and dare I say it, even a bit of class. But this leads to a flute pen style of very comfortable playing. English players always look very comfortable and relaxed, effortless, always control, and never over the top. Refined, classy, if you will. Almost like, like a Victoria sponge. Or a good fucking gin and tonic. And then we go to Germany, my dear Deutschland. Look at this jersey, by the way, for the video lookers. The video lookers. <laughs> Sounds like a football team. The video watchers, I'm wearing a 1992 Germany jersey. This is what I'm going to wear in America when I'm flying over. Can't wait. Anyway, Germany, dear old Deutschland, my adopted country. Uh, Germany values the team, not individualism. Germany values the team, efficiency, it comes as no surprise, and power. That is very German. Now, this leads to flute playing, very much suited to orchestral blending. G German orchestral players are fucking incredible. But that's why they're incredible. You don't recognize them straight away, but in the orchestra, their orchestras are so good. So their style is never being too soloistic. Very powerful sounds here, very strong bass. Even as a second flute here, you have to really provide a strong platform and an absolute organization of musical ideas that are super clear but rarely spontaneous. You'll find that often with Germans, which is why I think the German orchestras are incredible because if you have the conductor with a bit of imagination to shape this huge machine that they are, they're amazing. A soloist, they don't always inspire me entirely. Now, obviously exceptions. Now, all these things of these three different countries are, respect, are reflective of the respective cultures. And these cultures, although they always are adapting and changing, ultimately they've been around for hundreds, if not thousands of years forming their national identity and the national psyche of each country. But America, the USA, was only founded last fucking week, so they haven't had time to create a true American culture. America was founded, the USA was founded in 1776, which is fucking insane. What the fuck? Man, I know, okay, I know the Brits were there before, and then before that there was, you know, actual American people that you guys called Indians and made them fight the cowboys, but sure, nobody gives a fuck about them in America anymore. <laughs> but... Anyway, 1776 was when the USA, as we know it, was formed. Uh, Beethoven was born before America was born. I actually read the other day, there's a shark in Greenland that is older than America. They found this fucking shark, man. It was like fucking a couple hundred years old. Older than America, there's a shark. Half the pubs in Belfast are older than America. White's Tavern, brilliant, brilliant pub just off North Street in Belfast. It was founded in 1630. It was a pub in 1630. It was built before that, but it became a pub in 1630. There's older buildings than that in Belfast. Fucking Twining's Tea, the best tea in the world. 1706, second best tea. Thompson's Tea is the best tea in the world. Uh, 1706, tea. The English have been bringing tea before you even had a country. I've got fucking butter in my fridge. It's been knocking about longer than America. So what are American cultural values if you haven't had the time to build that up? Now, obviously, we have modern American culture. That's very different. We have you know, Hollywood and Bob Dylan and Kenny Rogers and the Eagles and Cheetos. But what's before the 1900s? Because that's so important to know. And I think it genuinely affects the flute school and the psyche of musicians. Now, to me, it seems, after all my research, American culture is this mixture, a hot pot of other worldwide cultures. Now, don't, don't tell the Republicans in America that. Or they'll have me sent to Mexico, have me shipped over the border, throw me over the wall. But half the, half the fucking cities in America have Spanish names. The other day, when we were, the other week, when we were planning our trip to America, my girlfriend was joking, going, oh, Los Angeles. And I was like, why are you saying it like that? And she went, because it's a Spanish name. And I was going, no, it's, it's Los Angeles. And she went, Gareth. And I was like, oh, fuck, right enough. Everywhere we're going, San Antonio. Not, <laughs> it's a Spanish. El Paso, Del Rio, Las Vegas. I'm even saying with a Spanish accent now. It's all immigration, man. And all their great foods, they're all from European immigrants. Half their presidents have been fucking Irish, for God's sake. America's a melting pot, and actually, I fucking love that. This is the best thing about America. We're planning to stop our road trip in towns in Texas that speak German. There's cities around San Antonio where they speak German. There's Dutch towns, Irish towns, French towns. It's fucking class. I love that about America. And even beyond colonial influences, there's immigration all over America from Asia, Africa, Latin America, and of course indigenous culture from the actual fucking americans so uk usa culture is just this big wonderful mix and i love it but with something like classical music that could be difficult 
because classical music is so steeped in this long, heavy European-centric tradition that it takes way longer than you know the hundred or so years of true American culture to have the tangible effect. Hollywood hasn't affected classical music. Not well, it started to, but not fully. Not as long as these deep ingrained cultures. So, like all American things, we have to look to find out where the flute school actually started. We have to ask the American flute school, where are you from? And then it'll say American. We'll say, no, but where are you really from? Because we can tell by looking at its skin that it's not there. <laughs> That's a joke, by the way. That's a joke. God damn it, don't get me cancelled for that. But where are you, re- where are you from, from? Where are your parents from? Is what we're going to have the ask the American flute school. So, mes amis, it makes me so happy to tell you. The American flute school comes from La France. My adopted country. I don't live there anymore, but my heart's very much so still in La France. Now, Paris to America is this wee chapter. There is an incredible, and I mean genuinely incredible, doctoral thesis by a person called, uh, if I wrote that down right, Demeter Fair? Demeter, is that her name? Their name, I don't even know if it's a guy, girl, non-binary. Um, Demeter Beferos Fair. I really hope I haven't fucked that up. I'm sorry if I have, because... This person has wrote an incredible piece of work. I'm just not very good with these kind of names. Um, if it's not hard in Ireland, I don't know it. But anyway, I'll check that. Uh, it was written at Ohio State University. So if anyone knows this person, please, for the love of Christ, get in touch with me about them because I cannot tell you how stunning this piece of work is. And it's on the internet for free. So uh, it's fucking incredible. And then it's she. I'm, I'm presuming she. I googled this before to check if the name is generally male or female. It seems to be a female name. So I'm going to... No, do you know what? No, I won't say she. I'll say they. No, I'll say they. Um, they did an extensive survey of American flutists, like extensive, to trace their flute family tree, in inverted commas. So like your flute family tree is your teacher and your teacher's teacher and your teacher's teacher's teacher and you say that four times fast to see how that goes. Have a gin and tonic and say teacher's teacher's teacher four times. (laughs) So it is amazing what she's done. They've done, sorry. It's amazing what they've done and the results, holy fuck, 91% of American flute players, when the survey was done, uh, can trace their heritage back to one person, and that is Georges Barrère. Now, why am I saying that? Like, I've got a frog stuck in the back of my throat? Because he was French. And if I haven't mentioned before in this podcast, I speak French. It's not even French, so I'm going to do it with the accent français. Now, Barrère was a student of Tafanel. We all know who Tafanel is. Paul Tafanel. Paul Tafanel. We'll say Paul if you want. Uh, so he was a student at Tafanel and then he moved to the USA in the early 1900s to teach and play in New York City. Now his influence is so huge in American flute playing that it's not really for his own teaching to be honest. It's not his teaching per se. It's more of his very famous students, especially William Kincaid. But we'll get to that later, okay? Now, anyway, 91% of flute players from American trace their lineage back to Mr. Barrier. 80%, 87% of those are descendant of Baha because of William Kincaid. Can we call him Billy Kincaid? Do they ever go by Billy? Do Americans do that? Do he's call Willie's Billy? Is that disrespectful to Billy Kincaid? I'm going to call him Billy Kincaid. Anyway, he's the real, the granddaddy of the American flute school. As Tafanel was in France. And again, if you haven't seen the episode in the French flute school, Fucking stop what you're doing. I'm not explaining myself twice. Go and watch that because I'll give you all the background you need to this podcast, which I actually think is really important because the French flute school is what the American school is. So go listen to that. Come back later. Uh, now, there's a great line, a big, long line of French flute professors that built that French school that we know and love today. It essentially started with Tafanel. Okay, there was people before, but Tafanel was the main shooting off point of view. Well. And it went to Gobert, Philippe Gobert passed on there and then there was people like Marcel Moyes, Gaston Crunel and then obviously we get even further than that you get people like Michel Debust, uh, Jean-Pierre Rampal and even now to you know, Philippe Bernal, Sophie Charrier and each generation is adding to the previous one of these professors at the Paris Conservatoire but Barrel was a student of Tafanel and then he went to America so he didn't bring the full French tradition or the, the complete one as we would view it as or as we know it now he broke off a wee bit earlier but he did bring some pretty fucking important pedagogical ideas over to the land of the free across the pond. Firstly, the system, the class system of performing or doing your lessons in France. When you go to lessons in France, even now to this day, if you're going to your flute lessons in music college, it's always like a master class setup. You always go with the rest of the class. They all watch each other's lessons because you, it's few that you can sort of get something out of it from someone else's lesson even. So 
always a class system, which I loved. It gave me the fear, fucking bad at the start, man. The fear, especially at the start when I couldn't speak French and I had to get up in front of all these people. And be like, bonjour, je m'appelle Garrett. De temps en temps, je... Je vais à l'épicine avec ma copine. Bah, high school French didn't get me very far. I love gin. So that system scared the shit out of me, but it does work. And it's a key component of the French educational music system. Now, Barrel brought that over with him as well. He brought it to America. And it, it's not really as big a thing in America in that way, but he did, the masterclass idea certainly brought out of it. So on special occasions or when visiting professors came in or on occasion, they would do that system. So it's not every single lesson. To my knowledge, it's still not that way in America. You still get individual lessons most of the time, but it's something they're aware of. Uh, next thing he brought was method books. Taffanel brought them all over. He had, sorry, Barrel brought them over. He brought Tafanel's one. Tafanel already wrote his one. Not finished it yet. And Altez. If you're familiar with the Altez one, Méthode de la Flûte, he brought that over as well. Both of those at the time were seen as the gold standard. Now, Tafanel's one was obviously further developed by Gobel, which gave us the Tafanel and Gobel books. And Marcel Moyes, De la Sonorité, all those ones as well. So there's a lot more that came after that. But Barrel still had Tafanel and Altez, which were great, 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 great books. Still are great books. Uh, he brought up the idea of a juried end of year performance. So in France, it's known as the the concours, which you'll have heard a lot. Um, which I think in the USA, it's not like France in the sense that your end of year performance, which gets your grade in music college, isn't open to the public generally. In France, it's always open to the public, so you can always go and watch it no matter who you are. I don't think that's the case in America, but anyway, it's still there. Back out, brought that over with him. However, in the US. The tradition quickly became a mixture of musical styles for the rep, whilst France remained largely like with new compositions. So when it came to the Concours, in France you were always writing new tunes for it. New compositions were put in the Concours play- uh, playlist. The fucking playlist, Jesus Christ, God. The uh, Concours set list. So at the end of the year, there would always be a new piece specifically composed for the end of year Concours. In America, that doesn't seem to be the case. It's a much more broad collection of the different periods and different styles of rap. So classical, baroque, romantic, modern. Which, to be honest, I actually kind of like. Um, but especially in France at the time of this, you were getting great compositions. Brilliant compositions. So maybe missed out on a wee bit. But the last thing that Barrier brought up with him, which was so important, was the silver flute. Up until this point in America, mainly people were mainly using the German wooden flute. It's still a Bohm system. But not the silver flute that Louis Lott was making and people like that. So, yeah, Barrera brought that over. He brought a touch of class over, if you will. Something all those pagans in America needed desperately. And they could still fucking use a wee touch of it. So, all these ideas came on the boat with Barrera. I'm assuming he came on a boat. I actually never checked this, but at those days, I think you're getting a boat, aren't you? When did they start flying over to America? Nah, you would have got a boat, surely. Um, and, yeah, most of these days are still here today in some shape or form. And on that, he didn't, he didn't come. Georges Berger did not pack up his fucking suitcase and his books and his flutes and come all the way across the Atlantic Ocean for fucking whatever it takes, I don't know, three weeks, going around the Titanic on the way, jumping under that iceberg, getting all the way over to America and bringing this wealth of French culture, this treasure trove of beautiful French words and sayings and traditions only for fucking Americans to start saying the word croissant. I've heard this recently on the internet, man. Americans say croissant. What the f- Even the English, even the fucking Brits try to say croissant. Are these tra- croissant? This is disgusting. Barret will be turning in his grave if he heard you do this. He's run all an insult. But anyway, let's keep going. As I said earlier, Barret, Georges Barret was a big influence in America, but mainly for one thing. One of his students, William Kincaid. Now, before we get on to Mr... Kincaid, we are gonna. Is it Kincaid or Kincaid? If I was Irish, I am Irish, sorry. If I, if I was Irish, I am fucking Irish. As an Irish person, or certainly as a Belfast person, I would read that as Kincaid. But I don't know if that's right. Someone might correct me. Anyway, before we get on to that, quickly. <coughs> the NLG podcast is free and always will be free. However, if you want to donate to the podcast, you can now do so through the Patreon. On the screen now is the address, and for the audio listeners, it is patreon.com forward slash the inline g food podcast it costs five euros 
or whatever that is in your gobbledygook American or Australian money. It's about five quid, I think, still. Five euros per month. And with that, you're genuinely keeping this podcast alive. You get four episodes a month of this podcast. Come rain or fucking shine. We're on episode 56. I haven't missed a single week yet, nor will I. Now, the donation every month, that's the same price as a pint. It's actually a little bit cheaper than a pint of beer. So if you get if you listen to all four episodes of this, and it brings you a bit of solace, brings you a bit of distraction, maybe even motivates you to practice your flute, which is wonderful. You can consider paying me for the work I do and think instead of buying Gareth a pint, if I saw him, I'll give him it online once a month. Happy days. So I do everything around here on my own, as you guys all know. There's no production team as much as I joke about it, unfortunately. I do everything. All the editing, production, promotion, marketing, script writing, every part of this is done by Inline G himself. So becoming a patron helps generate a regular income for this podcast, meaning I can turn down other work to focus on it. And as an artist, it's really nice to get paid for your art. It's a huge thing for my self-esteem and my self-worth. And I mean it, guys, you're keeping this podcast alive. Without the Patreon, I would have dropped out, purely for the motivation alone. Although the money's nice too, because it really, you know, being an artist is not easy. Uh, So it lets me also travel and meet the best food players in the world and ask them who their favourite Spice Girl is. So... You will, if you sign up to Patreon, you'll get the episodes a wee bit earlier, you get to put your questions to the guests a bit further in advance, and you get a couple of goodies. You know, I try to thank my patrons as much as I can, so those guys got sent out inline G trading cards recently, free of charge. There's a couple of other goodies planned here and there for everybody, so thank you. So, if you can afford to be a patron, please sign up over there. It's five quid a month, as I said, you can unsubscribe at any time. No charges, no weird shit. Hit unsubscribe, you're off it. And then if you ever fancy jumping back in, you jump back in. There's also a free thing you can sign up to in Patreon. Go sign up for the free one anyway. It, literally free. And then if you ever change your mind, you can go to the paid level. You don't get the benefits of the free one, but it keeps you in the loop and part of the community. So there you go. So if you can afford it, go sign up over there. It is hugely appreciated. It really is. It means so, 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 so much to me. And again, thank you to the patrons who are already there. And if you can't afford it, maybe you're out of work, maybe times are hard. There's a cost of living crisis on the minute, lads. Don't worry about it. Keep listening for free. Grand. And the other quick one, uh, Flute Center New York. Guys, if you buy, listen, if you buy anything from Flute Center New York, use the code inline G. It'd probably take some money off it. Okay, just fucking fire it in and see if it works, right? Flute Center, God bless them. They are the first people to jump on this podcast and openly support this podcast, which is not an easy thing to do. In the current climate, I know that the honesty and especially the mental health topics that I've covered here, things like the toxic masculinity episode, the episode with Sammy Sussman, these are subjects that not a lot of people want to talk about. The sponsors don't tend to enjoy that. So fair play to Flute Center in New York. They have jumped on that and they've made me an influencer, I think it is, or a partner or something, whatever it is. Anyway, thank you to those guys. They're fucking great. I would not spon- I would not allow a sponsor or an affiliate on this podcast if I didn't believe that they were good for you. Honestly, I've turned away some weird shit. Some of those snake oil things, you know, the fucking stupid gadgets, they've all tried to sponsor this podcast. Then go fuck themselves. I'm not letting any of that shit sponsor it. But Flute Center New York are brilliant. They are class, and I cannot wait to go one day. So, what do you get? Uh, 5% off all accessories. You buy it in person or online. Just stick in the code inline G. All one word. You get 10% off your sheet music. So, if you're going to buy some sheet music, please just buy it off Flute Center New York. Get your 10% disco within Line G and let me get an email saying, Gar, someone's used your code. Brilliant. I can't wait for that day to happen. Uh, if you buy a new instrument, use in Line G, you get free shipping, you get an extended warranty and all on them. All for fuck all. And if you're even trialing instruments, use the code NLING, you get free shipping to get the instruments posted out to you to trial if you live in the USA. That one's USA only. The rest aren't. So yeah, guys, go show some show Flute Center some love. I love them. They love me. We're all a big happy family. It's great. Now, Billy Kincaid. I don't know how to say that, lads. I really should have fucking Googled this, how to say it. Kincaid or Kincaid? I think Kincaid sounds better. And I don't know if I should call him Billy. I'll stop calling him Billy because I think I might be disrespectful. William. Now, here, this is what I was going to do. This is how it's going to do here, lads. So it's going to do this wee section, do a wee mini biography of William Kincaid. So we all know who he is. So where do you go when you're doing a biography? You go straight to Wikipedia. And I did. And the opening line of William Kincaid's autobiography on Wikipedia, not on, the opening line of William Kincaid's biography on Wikipedia is the following. Kincaid was born in Minneapolis on April 26th, 1895, but moved at the age of four to Honolulu, Hawaii. Here he often enjoyed diving for pennies in the harbour. What in the fucking Tom Sawyer is that? Diving for pennies in the harbour? Sounds like a fucking Bob Dylan song. Who the fuck dives for pennies in the harbour, man? What is this? Like fucking old timey shit. 
dives for diving for pennies in the harbor. What <laughs> this fuck? I don't know what accent to have in Minneapolis. Now he was born in Minneapolis, which is in Minnesota, which I had to Google because for anyone who like me is an American, we don't have a clue what that is. That's one of those parts of America that man, nobody gives a fuck about, to be honest. But it's like it's one of those places where if you're watching an American rom com, you've got the main character, and the main character it's opened with them already being in New York. And then you find out later on, they'll say stupid things like, they have like these weird phrases. And they'll say like, you know, you call that an apple pie? I don't know how to do American accents, guys. I'm sorry. You call that an apple pie? That's nothing compared to a, a Minneapolis, Minnesota mud muck. That kind of thing. You know that kind of shit. You know? And then everyone's laughing at them because they don't know what the fuck's going on in Minneapolis. Nobody's got a fucking clue. So anyway... I hope Minneapolis isn't a big place because I've just alienated the entire state, city. I, I don't know, guys. I'm really sorry. I don't know. I just don't care. It's one of those parts of America I just don't care about. Convince me otherwise. Is there something good that came from there? Um, but anyway, Kincaid came from there and he moved to New York. Not for apple pie, but for Juilliard. Now, quickly, I should say this about American music colleges. There's a few big famous ones, okay? Juilliard is the big dog, okay? Juilliard is the most famous American music college or conservatory. Although when Kincaid went there, interestingly, it was still called the Columbia University. It hadn't separated yet. <coughs> oh, I beg your pardon. <coughs> it hadn't separated yet to become the Columbia University. Now, I'm always amazed for a country as fucking massive as America. Because America's huge, man. And there's a lot of people there. There's only a handful of big, big music colleges. Everyone seems to go to either. So you got Juilliard in New York. You got the Curtis Institute in Philadelphia. You've got Berkeley in Boston, but that's not classical music. That's all other types. Um, you got Peabody Institute in Maryland. You've got the Eastman School of Music in Rochester, New York. And then you got things like the Cleveland Institute and Oberlin and all those kind of things. But generally, to me, it seems to be Juilliard or Curtis, especially. Those are the kind of two ones. Which is also mad because they're both like on this side of America. Like they're both. You know, and point in that way, because that's where America is. You know, the, the right-hand side of America, east of America. They're all over there, which is mad to me, because there's so much of America going over there. Anyway, so Kincaid went to New York and studied with George Barrera. And even played alongside Barrera a few times in the New York Symphony, of all places, which is no longer the New York Symphony. It's now the New York Philharmonic. Uh, however, he's most known for, after the war, he goes to the Philadelphia Orchestra, where he was principal flute for like 40 odd years and it's incredible again for those not familiar the philadelphia orchestra is fucking good like man that is a legit orchestra and it's funny because you consider especially someone like me what do we know philadelphia for apart from orchestras it's being a bit of a shithole you know like it's always sunny is in philadelphia obviously rocky was in philadelphia you never hear good things about philadelphia the eagles are out in philadelphia aren't they um but the Philadelphia Orchestra is actually one of what we call the Big Five orchestras in America. So the real heavyweights of the orchestral scene in America, the big, proper ones. And they've been the Big Five for a very long time. So you've got the New York Philharmonic Orchestra, the Boston Symphony Orchestra, Cleveland Orchestra, Chicago Symphony, and the Philadelphia Orchestra. These are the five big hitters in America. Now, at this time, the Philadelphia Orchestra were also conducted by the legendary Leopold Stokowski. And to be fair, under him, under Stokowski, you hear the recordings. Fuck. They were good, man. He did an orchestrated version of Bach's to Cat and Fugue himself, and the Philadelphia Orchestra played it in recording. Oh my god. Oh my god. Uh, now, Kincaid is a player. There's a few recordings to check out. I'll play one briefly here. Uh, this is him doing the Griffiths tone poem, which I've actually got for all the players we're going to be talking about today, so it's a nice little com uh, comparative tool. But this is William Kincaid playing the Griffiths tone poem with the Philadelphia Orchestra, actually. very interesting playing very very interesting to me that is very very similar to Marcel Moyes or Jean-Pierre Rompel very similar to both those big lads because uh, you've got that really fast and constant vibrato like this real oh, which to our modern ears nowadays it sounds very heavy 
but back then people were accustomed to it and it made sense and you do have to kind of get past it a little bit because if you move past that whole vibrato thing there is a gorgeous like rich dark sound like a really dark 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 sound now on the style one thing it's often said about Kincaid as a teacher was he often thought about note groupings a lot of the students have talked about this i find this from multiple sources now and yeah note groupings how does he teach it so let's say there's a group of semiquavers or what do americans call semiquavers 16th notes i don't know what he's called them anyway 16th notes so they're grouped in the sense that they go to the next beat as opposed to starting from the last or away from the last so if you've got a group of four notes four semiquavers in common time you got four notes bum 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 I think the automatic reaction is to phrase it like that. Bum, 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 bum. Put the stress a little bit on the first beat. Bum, 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 bum. And there was another set afterward. There'd be bum, 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 Which is a very Baroque style of playing because the Baroque influence comes into that because of the harpsichord where obviously it's got an instant decay on the sound. So as usually at the harpsichord, it starts getting quieter. So putting stress on the beats is very important. But what Kincaid taught very often was to go to the next beat and to always be thinking of going to the next beat. So instead of bum, 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 we've got bum, 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 You can even see how hard it is to keep that in time. Now, I, you can hear this in his playing, first of all. And it's such a good way to sort of describe his music in general because the music is never static. Whatever William Kincaid does, it's never static. Sometimes to the point where it's nearly a bit too much. Now, this is my hot take on the American Flute School. This is a very important pedagogical feature of William Kincaid, which protects, potentially affects 87% of American flute players now, directly reflective of American culture. I think it really is, we are talking earlier about how to find the connections between the country's culture and its flute playing style or its musical style. I think this might be a little bit of a hint. I'm still, I'm, I'm putting on this thread yet. I'm not really sure where this goes yet. But we've all, we all know, we've all remarked on how direct Americans are when it comes to communication and how American culture champions innovation and individualism above all else. And that's why almost everyone in America, in, in America is brought up with this like steadfast confidence and belief to express their ideas, to express who they are, to go for their dreams. This is a very American ideal. It's very admirable in many ways. And this constant search that Kincaid uses to make the music go on, to see where it's going next, to constantly push forward, is very direct as a musical style. And it sends an incredibly strong message musically. You're really putting your foot down there and showing people what you want to do musically. And I think that is potentially the key difference between American style of playing and, for example, the French style of playing. And it still exists to an extent today. So the American flute school... The American flute school is essentially the French flute school with an American accent. You know what I mean? How you guys go croissant. That's... It's, it's still a croissant. It's still a beautiful buttery pastry but you guys have put something on top of it. You've, you've bastardized it. <laughs> but there is something to that, because there's, there's a very big similarity with the French Flute School. In the sound of all the players I'm going to talk about today, there's just a couple of things that are a little bit different. I think this way Kincaid is phrased, as, or taught the way notes, notes are grouped, is a key part of that. I really do. But anyway, so listen, Kincaid taught a lot. As a teacher, he was a very, very busy boy. He taught at Curtis Institute out in Philadelphia because, like most of his orchestral peers at the Philadelphia Orchestra at the time, they all taught there. So that was something that Leopold Stokowski pushed big time. He wanted to increase the kind of low overall musicianship level in the city of Philadelphia. So all the orchestral players went out to Curtis to teach as well, push people forward. And it was actually Curtis that promoted the idea of doing solo flute recitals. Until this point in America, the flute wasn't really a solo instrument. To be honest, most of the time, if you went to study the flute, at a music college in America, you would have been studying winds generally. You could have studied with another wind player, a noble player, for example, which a lot of these people did. So the flute wasn't specialized yet the way it is today. There was no solo recitals. That was brought in at Curtis for William Kincaid with the Apostle Stokowski. Until that point, it was pretty much unheard of, as it was in you know, a lot of places of Europe until the French dance came along. So building this image of the flute as a solo instrument meant he had, first of all, the pick of the best young players in the country because they all wanted to go and study with King Kate, so he had the pick of them. But he got to have some brilliant students, some really good ones. And two of them, two very famous ones, were Joseph Mariano and Julius Baker. Now, pretty much every major orchestra in Fair USA 
featured at this time a principal flute who had studied with King Cade. Okay, every orchestra, they were all there. But two of those students especially stand out, and that is Joseph Mariano and Julius Baker. Now, I'd wager a bet that most of you are more familiar with Julius Baker than you are Mariano. And with obvious reason. You know, Baker was the superstar. He had countless recordings and these huge orchestral jobs. He was on TV. He's a superstar. Now, I've listened a lot to both, not just recently, but my whole life. They're big names. And I'm not going to lie, Joseph Mariano was more my cup of tea. He feels a bit like the old kind of... The Orle Nicolet versus Rampal debate, Rampal Nicolet debate. I feel like Orle Nicolet is the flute player's flute player, if you will. And I think Mariano is in that kind of vibe. A little bit more of the true introverted artist, as opposed to the slight flashiness of Baker and Rampal. So let's start with Mariano. Joseph Mariano was born in 1911 in Pittsburgh. He was actually born on St. Patty's Day, which makes me like him even more. St. Patrick's Day, or what do you guys call him, Mariano? St. Patty's Day, with two T's. That makes me sick. So I, that's why I like Mariano. He's my favourite now, because he's one of us. Now, his dad worked on the railroads, and once he got a flute as a payment, and that's why they started teaching Joseph the flute, which is a fucking great story, man. That's so proper working class. I adore that. It's so cool. Um, so anyway, he went to study eventually with Kincaid at the Curtis Institute, and then he left Curtis Institute and went to play in the Rochester Philharmonic and teach at Eastman. Now, the Rochester Phil, for people unfamiliar with this, because it's, it's a strange thing. The Rochester Phil is still there. There's still a great orchestra this day. Not one of the Big Five, but still a very accomplished orchestra. Very, very good. They don't have the glamour of the Big Five, but they're still highly respected, especially in classical music circles. Very accomplished. They're not quite the New York Phil or the Chicago Symphony, though. They don't have that thing. Because Rochester is... It's in New York State, but it's not, you know, New York City. I only realized recently that's why the song is New York, New York, because it's New York and then New York. Yeah, I know. I, I, I never understood why the Americans do this, why they always say the city and then their state. And then we clicked the other day. But anyway, uh, Mariano played with the Rochester Philharmonic pretty much his entire career, right up until 1968, a long time. Now, during that time, he was approached by all the big boys in the major orchestras to come and play with the major orchestras. For example, Toscanini, the conductor over at NBC, we all know who Toscanini is, he asked to get Mariano in, said no. Fritz Reiner wanted him to play at the Chicago Symphony, he said no. And Eugene Normandy wanted him at Philadelphia as well, he said no. Told them all to go and fuck themselves. Mariano was the typical introvert, from what I gather. A true artist, never really sought out fame or glamour, and in fact maybe shied away from it deliberately. But his playing, oh mummy, it's beautiful. So, quickly, here's a version of the Griffiths poem, which is a lovely way to compare these three lads. So, this is Joseph Mariano playing the Griffiths tone poem, or poem for flute, with, yeah, the Rochester Symphony Orchestra, actually. Why not? I can't play more than that, guys. I'm sorry, because I'll get hit by the copyright strike. But that, you can hear the difference now. Go and listen to these, by the way, guys. But you can hear the difference with Mariano. He's still got that wild vibrato, but that's a stylistic thing and it's a time thing. Um, but the sound in general, it's a little bit more subdued. It's a little bit less... Ah, It's a little more gentle, a little bit more delicate than the Kincaid version we heard earlier or the Baker one you're going to hear later. Now, as I said, he's a... Very, very different man, Joseph Mariano, to the other big Yank fluter, and that is Julie. <laughs> Obviously, it's Julius Baker. My notes say Julia Baker, which I don't think it was Julia, unless he had a sister. It's definitely Julius Baker. Now, Julius Baker, the big man you all know, so we don't have to go into too much detail because if you don't know who Julius Baker is, you need to go down that rabbit hole. I can't take you down that. I can, I can lead you to water, but I can't make you drink. So, Julius Baker was born in Cleveland, Ohio in 1915. He was not born on St. Paddy's Day. Strike one. But he does share a birthday with Bruce Springsteen. Strike two, because Bruce Springsteen is shite. <laughs> and he studied with Billy Kincaid, William Kincaid, at Curtis in 1934. And then he graduated and he went straight to the Cleveland Orchestra as second flute. Now, there was this very famous conductor at the time, we mentioned him earlier, Hungarian. I hate the way people call him American. He was born in Hungary and he spent most of his life in Hungary, but anyway, Fritz Reiner. Now, Julius moved about in orchestras, Mr. Baker moved about, because of Fritz Reiner. Fritz Reiner always wanted him to be his first flute. So first, 
he was at Pittsburgh. And then he joined the NBC Orchestra, the NBC Symphony Orchestra, who dissolved after television wasn't as popular. But he played around a bit. Uh, he did a year in Chicago. He did a few other things. I can't remember the last one. There's one more. But anyway, after a while, the New York Philharmonic announced they were looking for a new principal flute. So it was 1964. They announced they wanted a new principal flute. Now, originally, Julius Baker thought, great, I'm going to audition for that. And then one of his mates said, no, don't audition for it. You're Julius fucking Baker. Let them come to you. And they did. So at this time, Julius Baker was teaching Juilliard, and he made a big name for himself gigging with the Bach Aria Group, an amazing chamber ensemble. Who I think still exists to this day, but especially in those days, they were incredible. Um, so he was doing that, making a very happy life for himself, and then the New York Philharmonic came and approached him. So from 1965 until 1983, Julius Baker was the principal flute there under a couple of conductors, but people like Zubin Mehta, Pierre Boulez, and of course, Mr. Leonard Bernstein, Lenny. So... Baker then quit the orchestra in 1983 to pursue a big solo career, which he did. He did. He really fucking did. He's got mountains of recordings. He was on TV. He was on that Dick Cavett show and all with Jean-Pierre Hompal. It's great. Like he's the undoubted flute superstar of the USA, Julius Baker. He is the man. He even played in the, the films, The Little Mermaid and Beauty and the Beast. The flutes in that are Julius Baker. It's class. Now, I, I won't lie. I've said it before in this podcast. Baker is not my cup of tea. I wouldn't choose to go and listen to Baker as a player. I can appreciate how fucking fantastic he is. Just personally, I find it a little bit too in your face. A little bit too bold, a little bit too brash. Uh, for the flashy kind of music, it's great. It really works well for the virtuosic stuff. But I think for anything a little bit more subtle, I find Mariano to have that slight European style. It appeals to my taste a little bit more. And But because I'm literally in the USA right now, chasing the American dollar, I'll say it for now that they're both amazing and God bless America. Now, to wind this podcast up, Mariano and Baker have taught pretty much every major flute player that followed in the next generation. Baker's successor at the New York Philharmonic when he stepped down was Gene Baxter, one of his students. Now, his students also include Paula Robinson, Jeffrey Kainer, Mimi Sinemann, Gary Shocker, friend of the podcast and great man, Jasmine Choi, Marina Piccinini, Hubert Laws, Damari McGill. It, it's like a who's who of American flute players, all studied with Baker. Mariano had a few of his big name students too. Dario Anthony Dwyer, who was the first ever principal flute, female principal flute in the USA and the second worldwide. She got the job at the Boston Symphony in 1952. Incredible woman. Check out my episode on female first flutes, or t- female principal flutes, I think it's called. Brilliant. The research on that was amazing. Like I'm not, I know I did the research, but the people who had the research and I put it together, it was incredible. Uh, Catherine Hoover, composer, flute player, was another Mariano student. Uh, Walter Gujalo, Robert Willoughby, man, Jesus, Robert Willoughby's one of my favourite players for a long time. These are all Mariano students, and it's worth noting, these are all players that are particularly known for their nuance, their tonal colours, their sensitivity as artists. That's not an accident. So, to conclude all this, because I, I said at the start of the podcast, lads, I don't know really know where this episode is going. And now I hit the end of all things, I'm none the fucking wiser, to be honest. I don't even know who's driving right now. Up here, up here, I don't know who's driving. Certainly not me. I'm not behind the wheel. I think I think the Bud Light Lime is taking over. He's taking the wheel and I'm just along for the ride now. So, is there an American School of Flute plan? I don't know. Now, as I said, with the French School, if we take that for example, it's so hard to define one, st- one specific style or school of playing. Now, for me, the French School is defined by its quality. That's the main thing. It's a creme de la creme of flute plan. It's always the best. And I've interviewed so many top French flute players in this and always ask them about this. And we get so many different answers of what they think the French flute school is. If you take Magalie Monnier and Julien Bonimont, my two, two of my favourite flute players, they are not the same flute player at all. They are very different styles, but they're both fucking amazing. Their answers about what they thought the French school was amazing and they're both French as shit. But they're different. So there's no real way to specify this with a particular school. Also, it gets watered down, it gets influenced as people study with more teachers and the world becomes a smaller place. These things all get mixed up a little bit. Now, I have that same issue that I have with the French school, with the American school, except I haven't interviewed a lot of Americans to really get into this subject properly, so I can't comment further. So, dear listener, as this podcast is released, I'm in America at the NFA right now. The NFA is on right now, and I'm interviewing. Maybe you're at the NFA right now. Maybe I told you about this podcast and you're listening to it. In which case, fucking great. Come get a beer with me. So I'll be interviewing anyone, and anyone, everyone who will let me. So in a few weeks, those episodes are going to start coming out. 
and hopefully we'll be a little bit closer to answering that question of is there an American style of flute playing? I think there might be. Can't back it up yet. I do think that thing about the grouping of the notes and Kincaid's teaching is fucking genius. I think I'm on to something there. I need to pull on to that. I'm on to a fucking winner there. But we'll have to wait and find out. So, for now, help an Irish man out. What do you guys think? Especially if you're American. Especially if you know these things. Get in touch with me. Help me out a wee bit. Because I haven't got the answer, lads. I've, I've ran out here. So, I'm going to leave you with this quote from Mr. Metro. I'm assuming it's the mess. Fuck, I need to stop assuming. Anyway, the Metro Fair. They had this fucking magnificent thesis. Really go check it out. And they also had a really cool project called The Flutist's Family Tree. And this is a quote. Finally, for musicians of all sorts, The Flutist's Family Tree sends a message that, regardless of our strengths or weaknesses, the number of hours per week that we practice, the fame or obscurity of our teachers or students, the schools we attend, or the careers we have chosen. We are following a road that numerous other musicians have paved to make the language and spirit of music come to life. And fuck all to say on that, lads. That's beautiful. Stanja boys, girls, and all in between. I'll see you next week. Mwah.